Thank you, Martin. Good morning, church. I'm Nongu, and I'm from one of the Vona Valley Life Groups with Lee Martin. Um, I'll be doing our reading this morning. It's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of God. Well, let's bow in prayer as we come to God's word. Father, we thank you so much for the joy and the privilege we have to gather together as your people, as your family. We thank you that we are here because of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to us through your word. And we pray again, Lord, as we pray week by week, that your word may refresh us, may wash over us, may convict us, may encourage us, that we may hear the voice of God as we read the word of God. So help us and speak to us, each one of us, and we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. The New Testament speaks about two comings of Jesus. The first coming, as you well know, happened 2,000 years ago, and we remember that. We'll be remembering that this evening. So I hope you can join us at our carol service. We'll be remembering that on Christmas Day. That is past. But there's a second coming, which is future, when Jesus will return. And what we're going to be doing over the next two weeks is looking at the second coming of Christ. Our passage this morning, chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, deals not with his first coming, it deals with his second coming. So you'll notice there in verse 15, it speaks about the coming of the Lord, meaning his second coming. And then he explains at verse 16 and says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then next week we're going to have a look at chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. And you'll notice there, verse 2, he has just spoken about the fact that Jesus is coming the second time. And in chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, he talks and he answers the question, when will he be coming? And we pick that up, chapter 5, verse 2. He talks about the day of the Lord, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So it's good for us to remember the first coming of Christ, but it's equally good for us to look out for the second coming of Christ. It's very interesting that Thomas Cramner, who wrote our prayer book in the 1500s. When you look at the Advent or the Christmas readings and prayers, he not only looks at the first coming of Christ, he looks at the second coming of Christ. And his argument was that it, if we solely focus on the first coming of Christ, we will sentimentalize the first coming of Christ and how right he was, that that is what our culture has done. So it's good for us to remember the first coming to look forward to the second coming and then to work out how do we live between the two comings of Jesus. All right, our passage this morning, three principles that will help us to understand it. It will be a great, great help to me if you can have your passage, your Bible open in front of you. Uh, three principles. The end is not death, number one. Number two, the end is not confused. And number three, the end is not alone. So that's what we're going to have a look at as we work through this passage, and it'll be great if your Bible is open in front of you. Two side roads. Number one is the word context. So it's always good for us when we're reading a particular passage to know what is the context, what is the wider meaning 
of that chapter and of the book. If you have a look at chapter 1, verse 1, we know the author was the Apostle Paul. We know that he was writing to a church, the church of Thessalonica, that's in modern-day Greece. In actual fact, Paul had planted that church, and you can pick that up in Acts 17. And he'd only spent three weeks with that church, and because of persecution, he had to flee. And now he's writing to teach them and encourage them in their Christian walk. Have a look at chapter 4, verse 1. Paul tells us why he's writing this chapter. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. So Paul is writing this to encourage them to please God. He's writing them to encourage them how to walk with the Lord and to do so more and more. And it's interesting what he deals with in chapter 4 in walking with God and pleasing God. Verse 3 to 8, it's how to please God when making life, the sex life. Verse 9 to 12, how to please God to stay alive, your work life. And then verse 13 to 18, how to please God when it comes to the end of your life, your death. Now, it's quite striking. Just think about that. Walking with God, pleasing God, is not some new age spirituality. It's not some spiritual esoteric experience that you have when you you light candles or where you burn incense or when you walk in the forest trying to find your spirituality or when you're at a gospel rock concert and your emotions and feelings are on steroids. No, walking with God, pleasing God, happens in our ordinary lives, day by day. It happens in the bedroom, it happens in the boardroom, and it happens at your mom's funeral. That's the normal Christian life, pleasing God, walking with God in the ordinary events of life. Now, I don't need to tell you that in our South African culture, people don't want God in their bedroom. They don't want God telling them what to do with sex. It's none of his business. I don't need to tell you that most people, in fact, even most Christians, don't think God is concerned about their work life. You serve God Sunday mornings, and then you do your own thing Monday to Saturday. I don't need to tell you that most South Africans hide from death. People don't want to talk about death, do they? Don't use the word they say. Because if you don't use the word, hopefully it will go away if you ignore it. May I suggest that if you don't get these three things right and in order, sex, work, and death, your life is going to get very disordered, chaotic. Actually, it will end in tears. You see, one of the wonderful things about Jesus is that if you belong to him, He not only gets things right for the next life, he brings order and peace in this life, to your sex life, to your work life, to your inevitable death. Because we're all going to die. I was having breakfast with a friend of mine Tuesday morning from Cape Town, Alan. Alan's about my age, so it's not long to go. And um, (laughs) we we were talking as one does, about what he's going to do with his money when he dies. Uh, and uh, he said, so he, so he, so Chippy, you know Alan. And Alan said, if I die. I said, Alan, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, just wait a minute, yeah. Not if I die. Alan, when you die. <laughs> Guys, we got to get it right. And Paul gives us instructions, both for this life and the next life. Your sex life, your work life, and your death. And that's what he's doing here. How do we please God? How do we walk with God in these areas? And this morning, we're looking particularly at the area of the second coming of Christ and our death. Second side road is the word ignorance. Throughout this letter, Paul is very concerned that they don't remain in ignorance. Notice chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, Have a look at chapter 4, verse 2. He says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Paul, understand that it's important that you don't remain ignorant. You receive instruction. 
Chapter 4, verse 9, notice Paul says that it's important that they are taught by God. Same thing, chapter 4, verse 13, Paul doesn't want them to be uninformed. You see, the Bible is very clear that many of the problems in the Christian life come from ignorance. One of the reasons you are struggling with all kinds of things is because you don't know God's word. You don't know God's instructions. You don't understand his purposes. You don't understand the big picture, and so you struggle with all kinds of things. And Paul is saying one of our greatest problems in the Christian life is ignorance. And that is why I need to teach you, he says. That is why I need to instruct you. So you as a Christian, you may be struggling with your sexuality because you don't understand God's plans, God's purpose, God's parameters for sex and gender. You may be struggling with your work, with your employment, because you don't understand that God cares deeply about your work life, your ethics, your behavior, your motives at work. You may be struggling with huge anxiety and stress about things in this world, things that could happen next year. Perhaps you are stressing about your own death because you don't understand what God has given us, what God has taught. You don't understand God's providence, God's sovereignty, God's parameters when it comes to death and the second coming of Christ. That's why it's important that when, when we meet as God's people, and we do that Sunday by Sunday, midweek at our life groups, explore, we study God's word. We are studying God's word so that we fully understand who God is, what his purposes are, and how we fit into that. All right, there are the two side roads. Let's go into principle number one. The end is not death. Let me read 14 and 15. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now there was a particular question troubling the church in Thessalonica. They knew that Jesus would return. Paul had taught them that when he had still been with them. They knew that living believers would be united to Jesus when he returned. But what about those believers who had died before the return of Christ? Have they missed out? Have they missed the bus? Some years ago, many years ago, one of our younger ministers, Innocent, who I'd sent to Bible school, he graduated, he came back into ministry in Soweto, and he died at 28, 29. He just got married, just had a baby. Well, has Innocent missed the bus? Where is he? Has he missed out? No, says Paul, verse 14. Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. That's innocent. That's your mom who was in Christ. In fact, verse 15, if the Lord comes during our lifetime, imagine that he became during our lifetime. The sooner the better, I reckon. We will not precede innocent or your mom. No, Jesus will come to collect us, and innocent and your mom will come with him. Isn't that wonderful? My mom and dad are with the Lord. They became Christians late in life, and they were the Lord. And if Jesus should come now, he will come with them. I'll see them, I'll be with them. Good question. He uses the word sleep, being asleep, talking about death. In fact, he does it three times in three verses. Notice there verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Verse 14. Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. He's talking about those who have died. Verse 15, same thing. They will not precede those who have fallen. We will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Well, Paul isn't teaching that when you die, you are unconscious or you're in, in a coma. No, you're dead. Uh, he's not teaching this unconscious state. No, you're dead. The reference to sleep in the Bible when Christians have died 
is the idea that it's temporary. It's the idea that it's momentary. The key thing about being asleep is that you'll be awake. That's why when, when Jesus uh, went to the graveside of Lazarus, his friend, John chapter 11, and his friend had died, he'd been dead three days, his body was almost decomposing. And we read there, our friend, Jesus says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him, meaning I will raise him from the dead. And he did. You see, that's precisely the knowledge that gives us hope at your mom's funeral. She loved the Lord. And you grieved the pain, the the loss, the separation. That's the thing, the separation. Sometimes it's excruciating. But we don't grieve, notice the end of verse 13, as those who don't have hope. No, we grieve as those who have hope. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. So your mom, who is in Christ, has died, and she will rise again. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So death is not the end for the Christian. You've fallen asleep, and one day the Lord Jesus will gently wake you up again. It's said that in the Victorian age, so I was just a toddler, and... uh, In the Victorian age, I can't really remember, but in the Victorian age, people openly talked about death, but they didn't talk about sex. In our age, people openly talk about sex, but they don't talk about death. Haven't you discovered that people don't even want to use the word death? So we use euphemisms. Someone is deceased. Someone has passed away. Someone is departed. Someone is late. You may even be very rude and say someone is pushing up the daisies. (laughs) But not death. We avoid the word. Philip of Macedon was the father of Alexander the Great. He ordered a servant to stand in his room every day and say, Sir, you will die. Every day. It's a good reminder. In contrast, King Louis XIV of France decreed that the word death should never be uttered in his presence. I suspect that we are much more like Louis than Philip. We deny death. We don't want to think about it. We don't even want to talk about it, and we just hope it will go away. But Paul had no such inhibitions. On the contrary, Paul says, we are all going to die. You will die. I will die. As you well know, there are only two certain things in life, death and taxes. Can't get away from them. But, Paul says, I don't want you to live in fear, in superstition, in ignorance. No, just as Christ died and rose, so those in Christ will die and rise again. Two comments. One is about bereavement. We all know that death hurts deeply. That's why, that's why grief is so painful, so excruciating. It's the separation. Jesus knew that pain, so he wept at the graveside of Lazarus. So when a loved one dies, even a Christian loved one, it's right to weep, it's right to grieve, it's right to cry out to God in your pain, in your anguish, in your loneliness. Paul is not prohibiting grief. He is prohibiting hopeless grief. I I sometimes think Christians feel grief. Uh, Yeah, who knows? But but I sometimes think Christians feel these things deeper than non-Christians because we're more whole as Christians. So we'll feel the heights more and the depths more. Leighton Ford, a A Canadian evangelist lost his eldest son, Sandy, at age 21. He wrote a book about Sandy. He talks about the combination of tears and questions and silence. He says, and I 
he's so right. When you love deeply, you hurt deeply. He talks about the struggle to bring our faith and our emotions together. Of course we grieve, but not like non-Christians. Because I know my young friend, Innocent, is asleep in Christ. He's with Christ. And in a sense, one day Christ will wake him up and bring him together with him and collect people like you and me and my mom. Second comment is the word solidarity. You'll see it in just a moment. If you Google the word Ramora fish, not now. (laughs) Ramora fish are very interesting fish. They're sometimes called sucker fish. And they are regarded as one of the laziest fish in the ocean. In fact, they are poor swimmers, and yet they swim thousands of kilometers every year. They attach themselves to a sea creature or even a boat, but especially to sharks by means of a suction disc. So it's more than slipstreaming. They, they attach themselves with a suction disc, which I'm told is on the back of their head, back of their body, and that suction disc is attached to the shark. So when the shark swims, they swim. When the shark feeds, they feed. When the shark sleeps, they sleep. When the shark frightens off an enemy, they are safe. <laughs> That's us and Christ. Christ is, so to speak, like the shark. And we are in Christ. We, the Ramora fish, in verse 14 and 15, is the Pauline version of the Ramora fish. If God didn't abandon Jesus to death, he won't abandon Christians to death either. There's this unbreakable solidarity, like a Ramora fish and a shark, between the people of Christ and Christ himself, and death cannot destroy it. So if you are in Christ, you have a suction pad, so to speak, between yourself and Christ. Christ dies, you die. Christ is risen from the dead, you are risen from the dead. What happens to the shark happens to the fish. What happens to Christ happens to you. You are with Christ in life, in death, in resurrection. So Jesus died and rose, verse 14. There's good evidence. And if you want to know what that evidence, come and speak to David or Rafa or myself afterwards. There is good, solid evidence for the resurrection of Christ. If you know that and believe that, you will never see death as other people do. Because in Jesus, you will rise from the dead. Just like the remora fish, you are safe. Because you are attached to Jesus. So coming to Jesus is not just a decision about truth. It is that, but it's much more than that. You are welded to Jesus. So from that time on, death is really just like falling asleep. Of course the others grieve. But Jesus will gently wake you into his presence on the other side. Because he's already done that in his death and resurrection. He's been there. What an extraordinary truth. What an extraordinary truth, my dear friends. We have the antidote, and we remember that this morning at the Lord's table. We have the antidote to death. Imagine that. You have the antidote to death. We do not need to live in fear. We do not need to live in superstition. We don't need special powers and special omens and special anything because we have Jesus. He has died and God has raised him from the dead. We are welded into Jesus. We are connected in life and in death and in resurrection forever and all eternity. So when you one day land up in heaven and everyone around you is so surprised that you are there, you are going to say, I'm with him. That's what you're going to say. I'm with him. He died and he rose and I'm with him. 
By the way, when you die, you will immediately be with the Lord. The idea of purgatory or karma or reincarnation is not biblical at all. It's nonsense. It's mumbo-jumbo. Remember the thief on the cross who trusted in Christ. Remember what he said. He said, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Now, either he had heard Jesus preaching at some point. Someone had told him. Perhaps Jesus had spoken to him on the cross. We have no record of that. But notice, he recognizes that Jesus is a king. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He recognizes that Jesus will be resurrected from the dead. And remember what Jesus said. He said, this day, today, you will be with me in paradise. You will close your eyes in excruciating pain and death, and you will open them in the eyes in the presence of Jesus. This day, no purgatory, no reincarnation, no karma. No, this day you will be with me in paradise. The end is not death if you are with Jesus. If you're not with Jesus, well, I can't give you any comfort or peace. You'll have to hang on to your mumbo-jumbo because there's nothing else. Second principle, first principle, which is by far the longest. The end is not death. Second principle, the end is not confusion. Let's have a look at verse 16 and 17, because here we have the eschatological program, the sequence, the order of the end times. So I don't need to tell you that there's a great deal of misunderstanding, a great deal of fake news, a great deal of ignorance about the return of Christ. Paul gives us here, in these two verses, simple knowledge, simple information. In fact, four simple steps about the return of Christ. So let me read verse 16 and 17, and then we'll look at those four steps. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So notice the first step of the end times. It's not complicated, it's simple, but it is knowledge. First of all, the return of Christ. Let me just say, you, so if you've been around in the Christian church for some time, you will know when, when people talk about end times, you would have heard of pre-trib and post-trib and pre-mill and post-mill and a thousand years. Don't worry about any of those. Paul gives us four simple steps. This is all you need to know. Step number one, the return of Christ, verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. Now remember in Acts chapter one, we read how the Lord ascended into heaven and promised to return. Well, he's now keeping his promise. That's all it is. He promised, I will ascend into heaven and I will return. He keeps his promise at the end of time. He will return. He himself, not one of his deputies, not one of his representatives, no, Jesus himself, in person, public, visible, physical. And there will be three sounds. The Lord's command, the voice of an angel, the trumpet call of God, probably all at the same time. But who cares? It'll be great. So what we have here is the, is the eschatological program. Here we have the sound, these three sounds, which signify the universal, overwhelming, irresistible announcement of the end of the world, the end of history as we know it. So just as at the beginning God spoke, and his voice, his word, brought the universe into being, Genesis chapter 1. So at the end of time, God will speak. His voice, his word will bring the universe to an end. What is patently clear here with the return of Christ is that it will be at God's initiative. It won't be dependent on what we're doing on earth at all. God's initiative. It's not what's happening in Israel or the Middle East. It's not what's happening with global warming or nuclear warfare or Mr. Putin and Ukraine. 
No, God is in total, total command. It's God's call. It's God's initiative. So step one, the return of Jesus. He will return physically, visibly. As he ascended into heaven, he will return. Step two, the resurrection. End of verse 16. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Maybe you, maybe me, who knows. But the dead in Christ will rise first. So the Bible is quite clear. When you die, when I die, my body will disintegrate here on earth. But the moment I die, my spirit, my soul is united with Christ. This day you will be with me in paradise. Remember. However, when Christ returns, when Christ brings this world, this world history to an end, he will return with our spirits and souls and they will be reunited with our bodies. Our bodies will be resurrected from the dead. So it doesn't really matter whether you've been buried, whether you've been burnt, whether you've been lost at sea and your body, your flesh is little flakes lying on the bottom of the sea. No, God will raise them all up. God, the God of the universe can raise up a corpse for goodness sake. He will raise us up. We, our, our bodies will be resurrected and they will be reunited with our souls. Did you know, did you know that in heaven, so in the new heaven, the new earth, we will have real bodies, resurrected bodies. Did you know that? I always used to think that we were just ghosts and spirits sort of wafting around. Um, no, we will have our bodies, our physical bodies will be resurrected. Why? Because you are, your, your person is your body, your spirit, your soul, all together. The new heaven and new earth, we will have resurrected bodies. Of course, they will be much better. And for some of us, that'll be a vast improvement. <laughs> Just as the resurrected body, the body of Christ was resurrected. He had a real resurrection body. The disciples saw him. They touched him. He walked with them. He breathed. He talked. He ate. He ate fish and bread. I was going to say fish and chips, but fish and bread. <laughs> He had a real body, and we will have real bodies. Remember the remora fish. Just as he has a real body, we will have real bodies. Our bodies will be resurrected. Step three, the rapture. Have a look at verse 17 again. Now, people often confuse the word rapture. People, some people are scared of the word rapture. It's not a complicated word. It's actually a Latin word, rapture which is a translation of the Greek word that we have in English here, verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. That's the word. It's the idea of suddenness, of being swept up, snatched up. So those Christians who have died before us will return with Christ, their bodies will be resurrected, and those Christians who are still alive when Christ returns, which means all of us, will be caught up. Suddenly, raptured to, together with Christ. Notice again, verse 17, together with them in the clouds. So throughout the Bible, clouds symbolized the majestic presence of God. So the cloud led the nation of Israel through the wilderness, through the exodus. The cloud filled the tabernacle. The cloud was on Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The cloud was with Jesus and James and John at the transfiguration. It symbolizes the majestic presence of God. And, and we will be together with him in the cloud. Notice again, we'll meet the Lord not only in the clouds, but in the air. Now, that phrase is often used in the New Testament, the air, as the dwelling place of demons and the devil. Meaning that when Christ returns and we are all joined to him, he operates on the devil's home turf, as it were, showing his complete dominion and mastery of Satan, of his evil spirits, of all the authorities and powers that have set themselves up against God, Jesus returns and he reclaims the space that they inhabited and his mastery over all evil spirits and demons and Satan himself. Fourth step, 
First is return. Second is resurrection. Third is rapture. Fourth step is reunion. Verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. In fact, there'll be three reunions. The first reunion is when our souls and spirits are reunited with our bodies. First reunion. Second reunion is when the Christians who have died before the return of Christ come with him and are reunited with the Christians who are alive when Christ comes. The third reunion is when all of us together are with the Lord, reunited, not living by faith, but seeing him face to face. What a wonderful day that will be. Body, soul, Christians, Christ, all together forever. Now, time is gone, but let me just quickly try to address the objection that is in the mind of some of you here this morning. You may be new to our faith, you new to our church, new to the Christian faith. You may be here this morning under duress. Thank you for coming. And you say to yourself, Martin, I've never heard this kind of stuff in my life. What on earth are you reading here? I'm a 21st century man. I'm a 21st century woman. Do you actually expect me to believe this stuff? Corpses raised from the dead, yes. Trumpets, clouds, archangels, Jesus appearing physically from nowhere. All believers being elevated into the air. Do, I mean, Martin, do, do you believe in Father Christmas? Do you believe in fairies at the bottom of the garden? That's fine. But do you really expect me to believe this stuff? And Paul says most certainly yes. Of course it's absolutely extraordinary. But no more extraordinary than God creating the world by his word. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be stars, sun, moon, and there were stars, sun, moon. No more extraordinary than God writing the Ten Commandments on a tablet for Moses. That is extraordinary. No more extraordinary than God parting the Red Sea and the nation of Israel walk through it. No more extraordinary than the Messiah being born of a virgin. No more extraordinary than Jesus walking on water, Jesus meeting the, feeding the 5,000. No more extraordinary than God raising this dead man three days in the grave, dead, physically, visibly, objectively, historically, raising him from the dead. It's the same ballpark, by the way. God acting supernaturally in a natural world. As you've often heard me, that's surely not unreasonable. It's not irrational that the God of the universe should suspend his own laws to accomplish his own purposes. This is not science fiction. This is actually science. It will happen physically, bodily, scientifically. Real bodies in a real heaven, a real place with Jesus. Lastly, the end is not death, the end is not confusion, the end is not alone. Have a look, verse 17. We'll be caught up together with them. Who is the them? End of verse 17. So we will always be with the Lord. Who is the we? Well, obviously the them and the we is all believers, past, present, future. Your body may be burnt, your body may be buried, your body may be at the bottom of the sea, and God will gather it all up, and we will be together with Christ forever. United. No more goodbyes. Isn't that going to be wonderful? Some of our goodbyes are so, they're so hard. No more separation, no more loneliness. We'll be together with him. People often ask me, will we know each other in heaven? Well, yes, be good and bad. You know, Rafa will be there, not quite so sure. <laughs> the 
answer is yes, we will know each other. Because we'll be together. That's what it says. We'll be together with him. We will know each other. We will be there. Remember, you will never be the poorer in heaven than you are on earth. So there are lots of questions people ask about heaven. Most of those questions the Bible doesn't answer. What the Bible says is you won't be poorer in heaven than on earth. What you experience here, the good things, the wonderful things, the fun, the laughter, the warmth, the love, the productivity, the creativity, we will have it a million times more, not less. But our primary focus will be the Lord Jesus. So we will be there together. We will know each other. We will talk to each other. We will love being with each other. But all of us together will be focusing on Jesus the one who loves us more than we can imagine. If you're not a Christian, let me just say that none of this applies to you. And you actually, to be honest and frank, I'm sorry, you do not have any certainty, you have no security, and you have no hope. You may have some vague nebulous hope based on mumbo-jumbo. Our base... Our hope is based on the death and resurrection of Christ. And we are attached to him. So it's only in Christ, the crucified, the resurrected, the ascended Christ, who conquered sin, who conquered death, who conquered evil and evil spirits and the devil himself who can give us any hope. There is no other hope anywhere else. Why don't you come to him today? Let's pray. As the stewards come forward, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, let's spend a few moments of quiet and you speak to God and tell him where you are. Father, will you forgive us when we have allowed our fears, our superstitions, our anxieties, our, even our despair to override the truth? Forgive us when we've given in to these pointless emotions. Father, help us to focus on the truth, the truth of the person of Christ, his incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his return. Our foundation, is, our foundation in life is not found in this broken, fractured world around us. It's found in Christ. Will you help us to focus on him? Will you help us to live in the light of eternity? That we live faithful, godly lives because Jesus is coming back. Father, thank you that you've given us a visible picture of what Christ did for us 2,000 years ago. He was born to die and he died for our sins. He quenched the wrath of God and the judgment of God that we deserve so that we may know him and find hope in this world and the next. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. And we thank you that one day, as promised, Jesus will return. We remember that on the night before his death, the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, saying, 
Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me. You are so welcome at the Lord's table. You don't need to be a member of this church, but you do need to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be served grape juice and bread in your seats. Can you retain both? And we will eat and drink together.
what we have here is bread. It's only bread, but it's a picture of the body of Christ that he gave for you. Eat it in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. What we have here is grape juice. It's only grape juice, but it's a symbol of the blood of Christ that he shed to wash and cleanse people like you and me. Drink it in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Father, we thank you that we can look back at the historical life, death, resurrection of Christ as the foundation of our faith. And thank you that we can look forward with hope either to the return of Christ or that we will be with him forever. Thank you, Lord, that we have safety, we have security, we have a rock to stand on, which is Christ. So, Lord, go with us into this week. Will you keep us? Will you bless us? But, Lord, will you use us that we may share the same antidote with others who are in darkness? Work through us, we pray, and we ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.